Uh, I know I don't know about you, but I really enjoyed the little things they had last time during the break. So my priority is to get as many of those as I can this time around. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Victor. I'm an engineer at Google. Um, we've actually come here, a small set of us. There's a few more uh, folks here from Google. Uh, kind of really talking about our experience with task migration, in particular uh, our use of Creo. It's been about a year and a half that we've had this project ongoing to try to provide native task migration in our internal compute infrastructure at Google. So we wanted to kind of come talk about our experience with Creo, talk about our experience migrating a very large infrastructure uh, using uh, task migration, uh, what that has looked like, what, what we've learned. Uh, please feel free to ask questions at any time. Uh, we actually talked a little bit about this last Tuesday at the Containers Microconference. Uh, so we'll be going about similar things, hopefully in more detail and hopefully more time for questions. So feel free to ask any questions that you might have uh, at any time. If I don't know the answer, someone here uh, I'm sure will. Um, so one of the things that I always like to talk about is sort of where we're coming from. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about our work inside Google, but outside of Google, uh, folks in our team have been involved in a lot of the open source projects around containers as well as cluster management software, uh, managing of compute uh, jobs and infrastructure. Uh, so we've had folks who've been maintainers of Dockers, uh, out, out of our team came both of the projects in the middle, C Advisor, uh, as well as Let Me Contain That For You. Let Me Contain That For You is not a project many people know about, uh, but in essence, it's actually some of the core technology that we use uh, for actual isolation. It came out right around the time as Docker, uh, and so kind of got overshadowed by it, uh, rightfully so, to be honest. Uh, I think Docker manages a lot of things better than this does. This only manages resource isolation. Uh, and a bunch of folks in our team were involved in Kubernetes towards the beginning, not so much every day. Nowadays, I'll talk a little bit more about what we do nowadays. Uh, but kind of we've been trying to stay close to the community at the same time, bring things back and forth from what we do internally at Google. So inside Google, what we actually do is we're all part of the team that's called Borg. So Borg is our internal system for cluster management. It's the thing that runs everything at Google. And by everything, I mean everything. Like all servers at Google run Borg, all jobs at Google run on top of Borg. So when you set up a virtual machine in Google Compute Engine, it runs at, on Borg. Uh, when you uh, have a, a request coming into YouTube or, or web search, it's most likely being served by a machine that one way or another is in Borg. Uh, so it's pretty exciting, the fact that we can actually do that with such a large compute fleet and so many clusters all around the world. It gives a lot of opportunities, but at the same time, brings a lot of challenges, uh, in particular with such a large and vocal user base. So we'll talk a little bit about that, in particular in the context of migration. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit more about Borg, primarily to motivate why we're working on migration, what it means, and to specify a little bit of the language that we use throughout the presentation. Uh, again, feel free if you have any questions at any time. Uh, so at a very high level, Borg looks a little bit like what's on the diagram. You have on the cluster level a system called the Borg Master. This is our scheduler. It manages compute jobs, manages the life cycle of machines, as well as that compute job. On each machine, we run a daemon called the Borglet. This is the Borg node agent. It manages the jobs, as well as the hardware on the actual machines that we run on. Uh, if you're a user, you interact with Borg through a web UI, some CLIs, as well as our configuration language, Borg Config. Uh, in essence, it describes, this is what I want my job to look like, this is what I want it to do, please go ahead and make this happen. Although, honestly, if you're a user of, of Borg at Google, a lot of times you don't really interact with Borg directly. Borg has a lot of very good primitives, but it's not easy to use all by itself. And so generally what has happened is that folks have built frameworks on top of Borg. So stuff like MapReduce or Flume, which is the new version of MapReduce, are frameworks built on top of Borg to run a particular type of workload. So those are both sort of batch processing workloads. We have a video processing workload uh, or framework used by many teams at Google. Uh, so those are usually what you'd interact with. And then that system under the covers uh, uses Borg. Uh, Borg is heavily invested in containers, absolutely everything on Borg uh, runs in a container, including that virtual machine that you might purchase from Google Compute Engine. Uh, they do all, one way or another, end up running as containers in Borg. It's one of our core pieces. So when you do talk about sort of primitives of Borg, the main thing we talk about is a task. A task is sort of our unit of compute. It's the thing that runs on an individual machine uh, and actually does useful work for users. There's a couple of uh, key parts of, of or, or key properties of what go into a task that are relevant for this discussion. One of those is priority. You can think of priority as how quickly will we schedule you. If you're high priority, we schedule you quickly. If you're low priority, we might never schedule you, depending on the load in a particular cluster. We also have this concept we call app class or application class. In essence, it's a hint to us of how latency sensitive are you. 
And this is very, very important to us because there's a lot of optimizations we can do depending on this. So if you're a front-end uh, web server serving users' queries for web search, you're probably very latency sensitive and you really care about those milliseconds. Whereas if you're my MapReduce, you probably don't care if I finish this minute, next minute, or maybe even next hour. And so you're a much more batch latency tolerant workload. And so depending on what that is, we can do some optimizations based on that. And migration is a great example of where that comes in handy. Uh, if you look at the diagram, it kind of shows you a sort of a thousand foot view of what a task looks like. They're usually one to one mapped to a container. The container isolate res isolates the resources. You'll run multiple processes within your container as part of your task. And you also have these packages associated with it, usually just bring static data, your binary, your file system, stuff like that. Um, one of the interesting features of Borg is that uh, we do actually share, each task shares the IP with the machine, so we do actually have to do port out, which is a massive, massive headache, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, how massive of a headache that is. Um, this is, again, sort of native Linux, uh, so these are native processes. If you want something like a VM, you can run the VM inside your task, but Borg doesn't necessarily facilitate that uh, in many which ways. So now's when we sort of really start talking about why we care about migration. And we care about migrations is because of this, because of evictions. So as I mentioned, we have these priorities. Um, and what happens is if you have a higher priority task, it needs the resources, lower priority tasks, tasks get evicted. This means that Borg forcefully kills you. A lot of times you get a notification, one to five minutes, please sir, evacuate the machine, we need it for someone else. Uh, and for the most, most of the part, we're able to provide that for users. Uh, however, it does take you actually having to manage them. We have an SLO around how often we will give you an eviction, but it's actually pretty permissive. So we can evict you more often than you would really like to be evicted. Uh, and this is something kind of ingrained at Google of like, well, you're going to fail. Your task is going to fail. The hardware goes bad. If you run enough jobs, one of them's going to bound to fail. So you have to deal with failure anyway. What's an eviction? What's making that 10x as bad as it was? If anything, it makes you practice that. Uh, so it's kind of really ingrained into the culture to some degree. So the top three reasons for uh, evictions, preemption, as I mentioned, higher priority task, evicting uh, a lower priority task. The second one is software, software upgrades. We try to pretty aggressively upgrade our kernels, our firmware, and other uh, pieces of software that require a reboot. And so we will evacuate all the tasks to make sure we can bring the machine down uh, and bring it back up with the new software. And finally, rebalancing for availability. Uh, yesterday, there was a talk from some other coworkers at Google around a memory bandwidth antagonism. And at the cluster level, they have some neat control mechanisms where they realize the machine is too packed with memory bandwidth, and so they move the task to another machine. Um, they see, the task sees it as an eviction. And so this is kind of another use case that we have. Uh, and so that really leads to uh, the effects of evictions. And the evictions pretty much suck. Like, no one really likes them. They're very difficult to handle. If I'm a task, I have to write custom code for my application to handle what happens when an eviction happens, serialize my state somewhere, Borg doesn't help you in any way, you'll have to figure that out on your own. Uh, and even if I'm running a framework, we can't really do work that generalizes for other frameworks. Even if I'm MapReduce, I can only really checkpoint you in the units of work that you have, and sometimes those are pretty granular. We actually get feedback from some of our users that use these frameworks that even when the framework works 100% of the time, they still lose about 5% of their cycles from the framework not being able to uh, checkpoint out the granularity that they would like. Uh, so even if the framework you use does it well, it's still a problem. Uh, this is particularly a problem for a lot of these batch workloads that run a low priority, so they see a lot more evictions. If you're a high priority task, it's not as much of a problem. And so really kind of we found a very good uh, sweet home for migration for this very large batch uh, workloads that we have. And so the solution that we have sort of outlined for that type of workload is, uh, is that of a transparent migration. We know exactly when we're going to evict you. We know exactly how much time we have to evict you as part of Borg. If we could handle that eviction for you, it's wonderful. You as an application don't need to know ever, anything about it. Uh, and so that's what we aim to do with this project, be able to change your eviction to a transparent migration as part of Borg. And so we'll talk a little bit about what that entails, what we've been able to do through that. Uh, as starting to think about that, there are two main options of how to do this that we came up with. Uh, one is checkpoint restore. As you're familiar with, you stop the task. There's some blackout period as you migrate the, the state over to the, the new machine, and then you restart the task from that new machine. Uh, this is simpler. 
uh, but you do have a pretty large blackout. Uh, the other option is sort of live migration, where you have a combination of a brown on and a blackout. The blackout should be smaller as you slow down or, or partially stop the process, migrate some of the state over, and then reconcile that once you get to the destination. Uh, live migration would be great, but it is a little bit more complicated. Uh, being uh, lazy or trying to do the easier thing first, we opted to go with checkpoint restore uh, and start with that. And so what are the challenges as part of that? Uh, so one of, the, one of the key ones that we really had to deal with was uh, dealing with a network, particularly how do you migrate network connections. Uh, this is pretty difficult. It's even made more difficult by the second point of we allocate ports. What if you got allocated port 2020 and it's not available on that other machine that you're going to migrate to? Now the scheduler has to know what ports are allocated and what, ports we, and what machines we can move you to depending on what ports are available. It makes the scheduler's life harder and it makes it more difficult to migrate a, a lot of tasks at the same time. Uh, storage is always interesting and difficult. If you have 10 gigs on a disk, it's going to take a long time to get that out, and that's seriously going to affect your ability to migrate it. Uh, so that's something that we'd have to deal with. Uh, this uh, other one is a little bit easier, I think, for a lot of workloads outside of Google. Uh, but uh, a lot of tasks inside Google derive a lot of information from the actual system itself. So they read into the system, they understand what path they're in, what kernel we're running, what the CPU looks like, and drive a lot of information from that. It's very hard for us to migrate a job while they care so much about the system that they run in. So this is something that we had to make sure we tackled as part of the challenges. Uh, and the final one, and what we identified as the hardest part is like migrating the process of a Linux process is hard. A VM is in theory easier because you have a lot more control of how that's running. Uh, not so much so with a process in Linux. You have to understand exactly where the cut points are and go from there. And so through the project, we were able to, for the most part, address most of these. Uh, a lot of that was deciding it wasn't a problem, and a lot of that was uh, making use of other software that other folks have written. Uh, so for networking, one of the things that we did is decided to worry about uh, network connections. We decided we'll just drop them and have users handle that themselves. We'll talk about how that worked out. Uh, for uh, port allocation, we decided to do what most people will do, which is have a network namespace have a unique IP address. This is actually what Kubernetes moved to in a large part from their experience with Borg, that port allocation really isn't super awesome. And so uh, for these migratable tasks, we have a network name space with a unique IPv6 address. They have the full port space. We no longer have to worry about that. Uh, for storage, we simplified our life by saying no storage, no local storage at all, sorry. Uh, we'll talk about how that worked out as well. Uh, and, and what I mentioned about virtualizing the local resources, most people just say, oh, great, Linux namespaces. That sounds awesome. Uh, we were actually a pretty late adopter of namespaces for one reason or another. Uh, so this was actually, in ourselves, a change that we had to make inside Google is really adopt fully all namespaces. And the final one, and I think kind of for us the hero of the hour, is Creu. Is really not having to worry about migrating the state of a Linux process uh, was a godsend for us and saved us a tremendous amount of time. And we'll talk a lot into what went into that and whether it was hard or difficult. So I'll run through the migration workflow kind of at a high level uh, to uh, then describe each of the individual pieces that we mentioned and how we tackle the problems that we that spoke of. So at a high level, we start with a task and a machine. Uh, we'll start with particularly the workflow we have today of our own checkpoint restore. Uh, as I mentioned, it's very important that the environment is as isolated as possible. So that's where we have the unique IBD6 address, all the namespaces, no local storage. And we actually kind of get a lot of help from Google libraries. Uh, Google's a pretty interesting place where, for a, to a large part, we're very vertically integrated. All the applications, for the most part, that run at Google are built in-house. And so that means that we use a lot of these common libraries. Everybody uses the, the same library. Works out very well uh, for a lot of reasons that we'll go into. Uh, but that is a key part component to how we're able to isolate the environments that folks run in. Uh, so once we decide to do the migration, we go ahead, we pause the task. Uh, then Creo comes in, does all the hard work, serializes the state of the task. We transfer that state over to distributed storage. So Colossus is sort of the new version of GFS. It's a distributed file system. Um, so we go ahead, we uh, copy all the state over. Um, at that point, we turn down the task. The machine no longer knows of this task. Uh, the scheduler itself then decides where do I put this task. This could take some time for a low priority task. You can imagine we have to find a place to fit a low priority task in a potentially already packed cluster. Once we do find a space, we ask the machine to start recreating the task. We grab the checkpoint from the distributed storage. We once again ask Creo to do our hard work and deserialize the state. Uh, and then we continue running the, the task as we had before. Uh, so again, the isolation of this, of this environment in particular is very important. 
as the task itself, for the most part, doesn't really see much changing. The IP does change. That's something we'll have to deal with. The storage came with me. The, the machine, for the most part, looks the same, with few exceptions. Uh, and the Google libraries do a little bit of that work for us. Uh, so that ended up being pretty useful. And so looking into each of these individual pieces, why were some of these simplifications possible, and some of the things that were hard, how did we tackle them? Um, so in particular, networking. So networking at Google is pretty interesting, once again, because of this vertical integration. Uh, so pretty much all network traffic at Google goes through RPC. We have a common library called Stubby. Externally, most folks uh, refer to it as gRPC. And it's a library that everybody uses. And so if the library is able to handle it, uh, everybody is sort of able to handle it. Uh, and so we actually have some hooks into the library that allow us to understand uh, how the connections are doing and be able to deal with it that way. As I mentioned, we have a network namespace with a unique IPv6 address, not have to worry about ports. We also have something called BNS, the Borg name service. In essence, it's DNS, but for Borg. You give that to the RPC library, they know what to do. They'll, they'll reconnect if they see the connection drop, they'll redo the lookup, they'll do the lookup when they find out that, the, that what we're connecting to has changed in case the task has moved. Uh, so it's really neat because it handles a lot of these things with connection for you. And it's another area where having everybody use the same library really sort of worked out. Uh, to a large deal for us. And so as I mentioned, Stubby and gRPC for the most part automatically reconnect. We'll talk about what happens when they don't, which is super awesome. Uh, this is for the most part, again, transparent to users. Uh, and so for a very bulk, large majority of our workload, this sort of works out of the box, which is really neat. Storage is another place where we're kind of able to simplify a little bit uh, by dealing with, uh, most applications of Google are stateless. And by stateless, what I mean is that they typically require very little local storage, local machine storage. If they're going to use storage, they use a distributed storage system, whether that be something like Colossus or something like Spanner, which is another uh, large, massively replicated distributed uh, file system that also is a database. And so for the most part, most, most tasks using one of those two, which get all their traffic through RPC, uh, for the most part, don't have to worry about it. Uh, we do provide a little bit of local storage in the form of uh, TempFS. And by a little, I mean a little. It's like a couple of megs. And this, for the most part, ends up being uh, what most tasks need. We do have sort of a long tail of users. They need a, a bigger disk, or they actually need disk or SSD. We do have a PD, a persistent disk uh, offering, very similar to what we offer for our Google Compute Engine uh, virtual machines. So folks can use that. That's a little bit easier to migrate in the network environment. Uh, we do have some cases where we have local SSD or local uh, HCD, and for the most part, we just decided not to migrate those. It's actually worked out pretty well. We have yet a user that uses those as kind of wanted to request migration. They end up already having to do a, a few crazy things that we haven't had to uh, deal with too, too much. Uh, again, as I mentioned, the fact that all this goes over the network and goes through the RPC library is great, because to us, they just look like other RPC connect connections. And so that really simplifies our work. So storage is actually an area that we don't have to worry about as much as you would expect. Task environment. So this one's pretty boring for most folks that are used to something like Docker, where it just looks like full C groups, full namespaces, an isolated file system. For us, it was actually a bunch of work to get here. As I mentioned, namespaces was not something that we really had as much of. And this isolated file system thing was pretty new for us. For the most part, tasks didn't need anything, so we didn't give them anything. And now we needed to give them something. And so we went ahead and provided a mechanism to do that through a package, in essence. Uh, we do run the processes with as little capabilities as possible, so definitely no root, and definitely as limited capabilities as we can possibly get away with. Uh, but again, like for most of the outside world, this looks very typical to what you expect nowadays out of a full container system. When you talk about containers, they look a little bit like that. And uh, that's where Creo comes in. Creo really kind of significantly simplified a lot of the stuff that we had to do. Uh, Creo is able to serialize the state of the task that we have. Uh, so we do use Creo in a mode where it serializes everything from the point of view of the task. So we have the, the Borglet is able to create this container, create the C groups, create the file system and the isolation. It does that pretty well. It works well out of the box. We don't have to touch it too much. So we let the Borglet manage that. It'll create and destroy that environment and that system. And we let Creo just worry about the actual process that the, that the task uh, is running. Uh, so what we have is whenever we decide to migrate, the Borglet, which runs as root, uh, fork and execs the migrator, which again runs as root, and it runs inside the task container. So the resources, uh, being the resources being used by the migrator are attributed to the process, which is very important. That way we don't have to allocate extra resources on the machine uh, to make that work. 
the migrator is in essence a Google binary that has a few Google libraries built in to do stuff like talk to the remote storage, as well as to be able to do a couple of privilege operations that we don't want to have Creu do. Uh, and the main reason we don't want to do that is because we do run Creu as the user, as the task user. And this works surprisingly well with very few exceptions, uh, where the Creu process is able to serialize the, the entire state of the process without having to worry about having any kind of extra special capabilities. It sends all that information over to the migrator. The migrator pretends to be a page server for Creu, meaning that the pages just get streamed to it. It continues the streaming and encrypts them and it compresses them and it sends them over to the distributed storage. Uh, so it ends up being, there's a very, a very small fixed overhead that we need on the container to actually migrate all the information out of it, uh, which is pretty neat. And this was not the case initially and we were running into many out of resource uh, conditions when that was the case. Any questions so far? I tend to go at a fast pace and I get that feedback all the time. All right, I'll continue. Uh, so how has this worked out in practice today? Uh, it's actually been really awesome. Uh, so most migrations, what the user sees today is about one to two minutes of blackout time. One to two minutes from the time that the task stops running, we migrate all the state and bring it back up on the other side. This is particularly dominated by sending the information to and from the distributed storage, as well as scheduling. As I mentioned, at low priorities, it takes like 30 seconds for us to find a machine uh, that will fit this job the right way. Uh, so these end up being the large sources of delay. The actual serializing checkpoint restore is actually pretty fast. It's a few seconds, 10 seconds, except in some egregious tail end cases, which we'll talk about. And 90% uh, of the time, we're able to checkpoint restore successfully, which is pretty good, but we want it to be much, much better, and we're working towards that. The common causes of failures today, uh, for the most part, uh, we used to have a lot of these out of resource conditions. Uh, we still see some of them, particularly around things like threads and memory, where we have these highly, highly threaded tasks that run thousands of threads. Um, sometimes it takes a very, very long time to uh, checkpoint those. And so that we've seen a lot of timeouts around that. We also have some places where we don't actually replicate the host environment as well as we would like. These are all bugs, we're working through those. We see a lot less of those now than we did before. Uh, and finally, kind of various failures in serialization. For the most part, they end up being things like custom Google kernel features. We have a, co a couple of custom uh, kernel syscalls uh, that Creo doesn't understand because uh, they're not open sourced. And so uh, either turning those off for applications that use this or adding support for those in Creo uh, have been the, the mode of operation that we've had so far. So what have we heard from our users? Uh, so it's been pretty awesome. The users have been extremely excited about this. In particular, if you're a batch job, this is a huge lifesaver. Uh, just last week, we had a very happy user that came to us telling us they used to run this very large, massive uh, parallel processing pipeline that took them six hours every day. Uh, they turned on migration. Literally, all they did was add a configuration. They turned on migration, and now it takes four and a half hours. And so 20 in their runtime just from this feature. It kind of gives you a little piece of how a lot of these very large pipelines, even when one small piece um, goes down for some period of time, it ends up being pretty expensive in the long run. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that. We're having a lot of users that just come to us trying to adopt migration. It's very easy for them to adopt it, and so that's a large reason why they're very excited about it and why they're so willing to adopt it. Uh, however, as things go with users, they always ask for more, better features. Uh, so one of those examples are notifications. They want notifications for everything. Uh, they want to know what I'm about to be migrated. There's a couple of things that maybe we don't handle as well. Maybe they need to tell the, the master service that is giving them work, oh, please wait a second, I'm going to migrate. Uh, or maybe they want to tell us, actually, I don't have anything interesting to migrate, don't migrate me. Uh, so we've gotten this request uh, and we'll, uh, about being able to address that for users. The other finding that we thought that was kind of pretty surprising um, and on the kind of the chart there on your right uh, is sort of the blackout time and applications that deal with this as sort of the largest blackout time. So we find that a lot of these batch latency tolerant workloads, you can give them a blackout time of 10 minutes, some of them, and they're happy. Uh, right around one minute is sort of our automatic reconnection time, and so below that, they don't even notice. Any blackout time below a minute is completely transparent to them for the most part. Um, so for batch workloads, this is a great offering, and we've had a lot of success there. Lazy sensitive uh, workloads, your front end web servers, those not so much. Those we talk to them about 30 second timeout, even 10, 10 second blackouts, and they, they don't quite, uh, like that. They kind of go away uh, when we start talking about that. Um, for them, uh, really, the, this level of blackout is unacceptable, particularly when they're talking about certain queries that is sort of a level of milliseconds. They're not able to handle that. 
um, they've, for most of our discussions, sort of hundreds of milliseconds seems to be okay, uh, but there's a long way to go, from one to two minutes to hundreds of milliseconds. Uh, there's a lot of work that we'll have to do. But thankfully, there's a lot of batch workloads, and a lot of our capacity goes to that. Uh, so we'll be trying to address that uh, use case first. Cool. Adoption challenges, some of our, our favorite portions of what have we found. Um, so I mentioned that you know, uh, users at Google are, are used to dealing with failures. You're told your machine can fail, your task can be evicted at any time, shouldn't be a problem. All the code should be able to handle that, in theory. Not at all in practice. Uh, it turns out people handle failures a lot less well than you'd expect them to. We've had some terrible, terrible conditions. There was a job that we had, another one of these large parallel pipelines, that were, uh, we were ch successfully checkpoint restoring the workload. It was awesome. All our metrics showed that this thing was blazing. Like 100% success rate, it was awesome. Uh, the user was super excited. We looked at their metrics. They were not seeing any, any improvement in their run times. Uh, we, had, uh, we dove in, looked a little bit deeper. What we found the application was doing was that once, the, once they were restored, the network connection did actually drop. Most users just reestablish it, but they chose a particular setting that tells them, uh, don't reestablish it, tell me about it. So they got told about this, and they decided to drop whatever work they were doing and start from scratch. So in essence, they were getting evicted the same way, uh, although we were doing all the work of you know, handily destroying their process and returning it back to the state. So uh, that was a bit unfortunate. Uh, but we actually found a surprising number of users that do this. It's not the bulk majority, but it's enough that it's uh, been a concern as far as adoption is concerned. And so we've tried to work with some of the core libraries to figure out how can we detect these kinds of cases and deal with, and deal with them. Uh, the other part I mentioned is sort of the isolation of the task environment is particularly important and interesting. Uh, we've seen a lot of problems with the change of IP. Uh, I mentioned we have this awesome solution, this board name service, all the libraries use it, it's great. It's not a problem if you use that. We still kind of have some users that don't for whatever reason, and so they'll hard code sort of host colon port. Uh, they don't expect that to change in the runtime of the task, and when it does, it kind of becomes uh, an interesting problem for them. For this, every single time, we've just fixed it by telling them to use the BNS address instead of using host colon port, and it works pretty much out of the box as a drop-in replacement because all the libraries know what to do with it. Uh, but there's a fair, a surprisingly large number of users that don't use that, and so that has been another area that's been difficult to drive towards adoption. And, and the final one is sort of users being overly sensitive of what the environment looks like. So whether, oh, my kernel version changed, the features that I wanna use are different, or the underlying CPU is different, now I wanna handle things differently, or like the rack I was in changed and I was optimizing for that one way or another. Uh, some of these workloads that have been very sensitive to that kind of work has been a little bit difficult. Sometimes we provide too many hooks to go into your environment and understand what it looks like natively. Um, so these are not kind of areas that we have solved just yet, but they're areas of active work uh, that we're trying to understand how to improve on each of these pieces. It's very interesting because for the most part, no one does uh, any one of these individual one, but the combination of all these together means almost everybody's doing at least one of these. Uh, so that's been a little bit of a challenge to get through. I'll put the slides up online, by the way for the folks taking pictures. I should have said that earlier, but continue taking. Um, so Creu, uh, so it's awesome because we have been an extremely happy user of Creu because uh, we've been extremely surprised how easy it was to go from grabbing Creu, building it, and running it, and it just worked out of the box. So many things kind of exactly fell into place. Uh, we really have had a very, very good experience with it, both actually getting uh, Creo working, how it addresses all our problems, how well uh, it's been able to migrate, as well as the community, both folks ask that we can ask for help as well as advancement in areas like live migration. It's really been wonderful to work with the community as well as take part and, and uh, use the technology itself. It's worked so well that it's an area that we would like to continue investing in. Part of the reason why we're here and so many of us are here is exactly for that. It's an area that we want to make sure that we continue to invest in and take part in that community. Uh, especially as it becomes a, a more core piece of, of this particular project around migration of tasks. Uh, so we have had sort of a couple of changes that have gone through. You can honestly, maybe there's about a dozen patches that we've had, most of those sent upstream. Most of them are around a couple of pieces around uh, improving the performance for a couple of things around migration, or uh, there's been some limitations around how many things we can migrate and this and that, and we've, for the most part, we send those patches upstream. Uh, there's a few patches we haven't. Those have been Googleisms. You can imagine some of those custom Google syscalls that no one really cares about outside of Google. We haven't sent those upstream, but that hasn't been a particularly uh, big issue. So again, in one word, it works very well. It's been amazing. Uh, things that could improve. Um, one of those things, uh, actually, we talked about last, 
last Tuesday was security. And it's not really something that needs to improve, but if you read the crew documentation, they recommend, oh, run crew as root or run it with a lot of capabilities. This should be the default state. It does do a lot of funky stuff, so it makes sense. For us, we were able to simplify a little bit because Borglet does handle the setup and teardown of the environment, which is where most of those privileges come. And we've also added a couple of patches that crew doesn't fail when certain privilege operations that maybe we don't need go into play. Uh, for us, we did ask our security team to look at this. Uh, they told us that they were much more comfortable is if we ran this in user namespace without user, without the root uh, user mapped in and with as few capabilities as possible. And so we've been working very hard to try to reduce the capabilities that Creo needs in order for you to be able to checkpoint restore as a user namespace. And so we've been working on that. Uh, it was pretty awesome. Last Tuesday, we had a lot of discussions. It seems like we're not the only folks that have this use case in mind. Uh, so there's a lot of hope that this will become more of a supported and common setup for Creo. Other things that we kind of found about, we talked a little bit about performance. This goes past just Creo. There's some parts of the kernel where like they keep threads as a linked list. And so if you want to wait fit in all the threads, you end up being an N squared operation, which is not super awesome. And it, it, it bugs down when we have these thousands, thousands, thousands of threads workloads. Um, but again, that's something that I think uh, our kernel team so far at least has expressed interest in being able to improve some parts of this. We mentioned security, so I won't go too much into it. Um, the talk right before here was talking about switching uh, where the source code uh, for uh, some projects was hosted. Um, so I'm not gonna go too much into this. It's a religious debate about how to contribute patches. We find it to be a little bit hard to send text patches via email, but that's just a personal opinion that I will not uh, expand on too much. Um, the other areas that I think we're working with and we're very excited the community has kind of already started some work towards is live migration. We really see it as long-term the goal that we would like to go towards. We wanna invest into this and we're happy to see a lot of the community has already started work towards this. Uh, the other one that Andy mentioned on Tuesday was handling time. Time is hard, especially like Google, a lot of libraries look into the hardware counters that deal with time, and it's very hard to remove this, for, to either have the, the libraries handle it or make it somewhat transparent to them. And so that's where a time namespace, which was proposed by Andre and some of the folks from, uh, from Creo, really would help out a lot. It doesn't fix all the problems, but it fixed the bulk majority of them for us. And so uh, I think this is one of the spaces that we really kind of raise our hands and say, yes, 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 time name space solves a real problem uh, that we have um, and that we would like uh, for the community to help with. So future work. Um, as we move forward with this project, we're very excited with how far we've been able to come in a year and a half, but we're even more excited about sort of where it's going to go. Uh, long term, our goal really is to reduce uh, that blackout time as well as to improve adoption. So a lot of the work that we'll be doing is building this into more library, ensuring that or Google Library is able to handle migration, uh, as well as figure out some of those tough problems when people have, uh, when people have code that looks into their environment and what that looks like. Uh, our first step towards reducing blackout times will be moving to to uh, machine to machine uh, migration. So instead of going through the remote uh, storage, we're going to just go directly from one machine to another. From our test, this reduces it to about 30 seconds of blackout time, which is great. And we save uh, the round trip for the storage as well as the scheduling time. So that ends up being pretty cool. Uh, and finally, our real goal is live migration. Uh, from discussions with the Creo community, this is going to be hard. It's going to take some time, uh, but really is uh, where we'd like to go for uh, long term. Once we get to those you know, single digit seconds, uh, maybe even to hundreds of milliseconds, we can start talking to many more users and many of those latency sensitive workloads will be interested in this. So I think. With that, I'm more than happy to kind of take any questions any folks have. Uh, the only thing I want to say is, you know, I'm the person here, but really this has worked more than a dozen people over a year and a half, so it's pretty awesome that we've been able to get here. Uh, I'm also super excited how much help we've actually been able to get from the crew community as well as other pieces of open source software. Uh, so it's really been awesome. We've really kind of been able to uh, take full advantage of that, and we plan to continue to be involved with that. Uh, with that kind of any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. I've got a few. Uh, can, can you go back to the previous slide? So, yeah, this migration time, you have already reduced it to about 30 seconds. Uh, can you give us uh, like a rundown of like what takes most of this 30 seconds? Yeah. Because uh, this looks, I mean, uh, from my perspective, this looks yeah. like a bit too much, actually. Yeah. So, uh, 30 seconds, I think, would be. At the tail. So, like when you have a lot of these applications that have thousands of threads, thousands of various pieces of state, yeah. or even memory, that's really when you see 30 seconds. Oh, is uh, it like 
checkpoint, is it restore or is it migrate in the image file? Or For the most part, a little bit of both. Actually, Pavel behind you has, is actually the person that did the experiments. I don't know if you want to expand on it a bit. So there's, there's a few components. Uh, the big one is the ON square part on, on the wait feed. Well, wait for. So if you have a thousand threads in a process, then just uh, the wait loop in oh, yeah. dumping and restoring is taking a lot of time. This was mentioned in the yeah. other yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, migrating the image takes some time, and, and there's also a part of, of scheduling, so uh, Victor mentioned it. Uh, we might need, the low priority task might wait longer to be scheduled on a new machine. So with a machine to machine migration, we need to find a place where we can migrate the task before we can actually start migrating it. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of pathological. The larger the task, the longer we might uh, wait until we find the space. So this uh, falls into that, it badly. That's like sort of outside of, of crew. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, and and my other question was, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, can you go back, is this one, uh, yeah, this one, the about the weight feed, or, yeah, oh, this, this one. one, yeah. So are you planning to involve some kernel guys into looking into that? Because the yeah. original, yeah, so a, a little bit of history here, uh, the crew predecessor was in kernel checkpoint restore, yeah and it was fast and good, but not mergeable to upstream. Yeah. So we walk, walked around that by implementing yeah. it all in user space, and the whole idea was to like gain some traction, make sure it yeah. works, and then move some yeah. components into the kernel where the need is demonstrated, where yeah. we clearly suck doing this is <laughs> from user space. So I think we are about to yeah. be at this point, so the, the next step should be as no. you pointed out. So yeah. are you pl are actually planning to do that or? Yeah, so I think we're, we're starting to have those discussions now. At least we've at least started as a first uh, step, kind of talking to the folks inside our, our inside Google that work on the kernel, trying to understand, oh, wait, what would it take before we really start also reaching out? Part of the reason we're here is exactly that, to talk about stuff like this. So yes, most definitely. I think this is a place where we could really use uh, the kernel being a little bit more helpful. Good. Thank you. Any other questions? Hello. Can you please tell a little bit about how you export remote, uh, remote storage to application? Because I guess if you have some sort of fuse or NFS or cluster mount inside application, it's not possible to migrate it, migrate it uh, via Creo technique. Yeah. So you must uh, find some way to export export remote storage in some other way rather than simple POSIX like mount, yes? Yeah, that's where kind of the, the libraries come in. Like when you talk about distributed storage like Colossus, like Spanner, they get access over RPC. Uh, so we actually have file libraries that translate all this for you. So it's not really something that I would grab a third party application, run it here, and it could use Colossus. For the most part, that's not possible. Um, so it really is another place where instead of having to deal with POSIX semantics, we just deal with RPCs. There is a case of kind of our, our persistent disk. Um, that, I don't remember what they do under the covers uh, for that. That's more POSIX E, but also we have some other components that handle that that I'm not sure offhand. I don't know if anybody knows. But for the most part, it, it, most of our distributed system we deal with through RPC. Could you provide some details, please? Uh, how do you connect a network in space to external world? I'm sorry, like I can't. Oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, how do you connect network in spaces to the external world? Is it some IP VLAN or? Did you hear what you said? I'm sorry, I still. Could you provide some details, please? Uh, how, oh, it works now. <laughs> 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 how uh, do you configure network in space to connect it to external world? Is it like IPv LAN or something like this or? Yeah, so we have an IPv LAN set up on the machine. So it shares, uh, it shares uh, I think it's a slash 64 with the rest of the machine. Uh, so then the packets get routed there and then IPv LAN gets routed within the machine. Okay, 
So I'm um, not sure what the connection is between Borg and Kubernetes, but are you planning to bring any of this into Kubernetes? <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, we don't have any immediate plans. We do work pretty closely with the Kubernetes team. Uh, and a lot of the things that, as you notice, things like moving to like IP, uh, IP per task um, is something that they've championed and worked through closely. So I think that if anything, they might have an easier time doing some of these things uh, than we have had. Uh, but no, we don't have kind of any immediate plans, but it definitely feels like an area that we should make sure we start uh, poking that team about. This would be more generally useful for more than just us be much more difficult. Because they would be arbitrary yes. Based. Yes, that is true as well. I'm sorry, can you the so the, with Kubernetes, it will be much more difficult because then you need to checkpoint arbitrary Docker container rather than something that's controllable and uses all the fancy Google libraries. Yeah, that will be a lot of the, the tough parts. Even everything with storage, Kubernetes is very varied in the way it handles storage. So it will be somewhat limiting. Uh, so some of those problems will be harder. But wasn't there already some work to have Docker support Kriu? I know there was a patch long ago. I don't know if that was finally merged or not. I don't know if you guys know. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes the checkpoint. It's checkpoint sometimes restore, OK. It's in an um, unfortunate state of being almost broken oh. because it's under experimental and oh. almost no one, no one uh, enables it. this flag. So there are not, not too many users. <laughs> but people just try, try it, and, and yeah. they don't. No one uses it. Works with 73, works with 73 says Mike. Okay. You said it's uh, hard to contribute crew by sending patches. And what is your opinion? What is the best way to contribute to crew? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this sounds, uh, this sounds like a very contentious question, so I will let my co-presenter, Andy, answer. <laughs> We're also close to time, so maybe Yes, uh, we'll talk offline. Uh, Oh, here it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't have any particularly great answer here. I mean, pull requests are somewhat easier to deal with than GitHub sense. Um, I mean, it, but I mean, it's some sense is just how do you how do you massage this into some some some, some uh, representation of your change that people can then look at. So, um, it, it's just from us coming outside of mostly outside of the the. Linux kernel community yeah. I mean, for, and working on other open source projects, we're sort of used to other things. So. Yeah, yeah. So on GitHub is fine. GitHub is fine. It's really easy. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I think that would that, be a that, little that bit simpler would, for us. Just fine, yeah. <laughs> Not better, but simple for some people. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, if anybody else has any questions, I'm around and now there's snacks, so uh, feel free to catch up with me or Andy or any of the other folks on the team. Thank you. Thank you.